Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. You can support this podcast on patreon.com forward slash first paw media. Radio Free Palmer 89.5 KVRF presents Mushing Radio, hosted by Robert Forto. Mushing Radio is about dog-powered sports, living in the Great White North, and mushing. Visit our website at mushingradio.com. Here is your host, Robert Forto. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Robert Forto and you're listening to Mushing Radio here on KVRF 89.7 in the Matsu Valley. RadioFreePalmer.org is our live streaming site and you can find all of our episodes over on DogWorksRadio.com. And I am joined tonight by my co-host Tony Ryder. Tony, how's it going tonight? Uh, It's going really well. It's bright and sunny here in Kenai. Spring is officially here. The snow is melting, so... Uh, looking forward to doing the, the podcast to keep us thinking about winter, but definitely enjoying the, the warmer temperatures. I am too, and, and we still have a foot or two of snow here in Willow. Too late to run any dogs, but I always like talking about Iditarod. And as we've said in previous episodes, Iditarod is becoming a calendar thing it's happening something's happening all the time now and we have some news and notes to talk about tonight before we talk about our 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 featured topic but let's jump into that i understand that uh, the ceo of iditarod was interviewed on one of the local news channels what happened um so i just read the article i haven't seen the interview yet if there was an interview but um he basically touched on all the highlights that people are still asking about in regards to how the iditarod ended this year um he touched on the uh looking at the rules to see if he can if they can possibly be altered if they need to be altered especially when it comes to the sheltering dog rules um, I believe there was a petition um, by the three mushers that um, were penalized at the end of the race, um, and that happened at the end of March. And so they have to, I think it said they had like 40 days to answer that, come up with a solution, whatever. Um, so we'll be hearing more about that rule in the next month, it looks like. He also spoke on um, the current situation with the missing dog Leon um, which we know that they're now looking more in and around Nikolai I haven't seen an update in the last couple of days on how the search is going but I know they haven't spotted a dog just a lot of dog tracks that they're not sure is Leon or not but they're hopeful Um, but Rob said that they're looking at maybe changing um, policy procedure and rule Um, for that because apparently one of the issues on how the dog got loose was as many speculated um, the dog's collar was not the same collar that they started the race with it was a more of a slip collar and so he was able to slip out and get loose that much easier so they're looking at not only making sure that they have a more secure collar but they are talking about getting those gps trackers that some fans wondered was possible now i think that that's that could cause more headache than that because when you're out there in certain areas that's not going to work but if it gives people peace of mind it might be a good option and then the third thing that he talked about um he was asked about jesse holmes and i know we're going to talk about that a little bit later but uh he did make a statement on um the case where jesse holmes dog got loose and attacked and killed a residential dog in Wasilla um, a few weeks ago. So uh, pretty interesting. If you want to read up on it, it's at alaskanewsource.com. Um, and it's a really quick article, but it, it does give a lot of good information. So let's jump in and talk about that situation with the uh, uh, Jesse Holmes's dog and the, the little dog in Wasilla. I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, right before the Kobuk 440, Jesse Holmes was staying at a hotel in Wasilla, one of the couple right there on the 
uh, on the Parks Highway there, sort of right near the Walmart if folks have been traveling up and down. And I guess he was parked out back. The He let all of his dogs run loose, which is a common procedure with sprint mushing, but not necessarily as much with distance mushers, uh, just because of the way that we train our dogs. But I guess the dogs got away from him. He was in the trailer or doing something, some other chore, and the dogs ran down the hill and attacked a little toy-sized dog and ended up killing the dog uh, in in the yard. And uh, it caused quite of a commotion between him, of course, the owner, the city of Wasilla got involved, code enforcement, the troopers, the whole nine yards. And this is much bigger than a civil case than if your if your dog per se jumped the fence and killed the neighbor's dog. And you know, often uh, bygones will be bygones. You often pay for the cost of the dog or something like that. But there is some big time repercussions with this. And that's why we really wanted to talk about it tonight. What do you want to add to this story, Tony? Yeah, you know, I think it was a very emotionally charged story because we first learned about it, um, a lot of us, through Facebook. The owner took to Facebook, went on to one of the Matsu news pages and just went off, which as a dog owner of a little dog myself, I probably would be emotionally and adrenaline filled charged. Um, This happened, I believe, um, on March 29th. And of course, we know he went to the Kobuk, which was the first week of April. Um, So he promised to make it right, at least financially, um, is what the story was. But then they couldn't get a hold of him. And, And I don't think, I think a lot of the problem was nobody understood that he was probably on his way to the Kobuk. It, it feels like a lot of just, you know, all of the circumstances, it was the worst possible time for something like this to happen as far as communication is concerned. Um, but now you have the city of Wasilla, I believe the mayor made a statement saying, you know, charges would be filed. Um, the, the original post said that the um, officer that took the statement said, came back and said that they were looking at animal cruelty charges um, against Jesse, which is the big repercussion for him as a racer, you know, a musher who races his dogs. Because if you have one of those animal cruelty charges, not just a charge, but if you are found guilty of that, you are no longer eligible to run most of the big races, including I did a run. Yeah, that that's a huge deal, and I know there there has been several people in the past uh, that were found guilty of that, and I'm, I'm not going to name any names just for protection of of their privacy right now. But there has been repercussions where if a person is found guilty of this charge, they they are definitely barred from racing for a long time and possibly for life. So it is a big time repercussion. But what I found most interesting, of course, that is a very interesting part of this, but a lot of comments on Facebook and even on the mushing pages in general said, hey, he wasn't part of Iditarod at this point. Uh, He was, you know, on his personal time. Iditarod ended a couple of weeks earlier, et cetera, et cetera. And I know we compare and contrast a lot with uh, other sports, the NFL in particular we've talked about. And if an NFL player does something wrong during any time of the year, if it's a DUI or domestic violence or drug charge or whatever, there are always repercussions and investigations by the NFL, even if they are not anywhere near playing. And I think this is where this comes into play with uh, something like this, because I believe that there is a rule in Iditarod that says that you must conduct yourself with integrity and, you know, those sorts of of, uh, adjectives. And I think that that goes along with this. And if you recall, Tony, there was a musher several years ago that uh, uh, got in some hot water over a domestic violence charge. And of course, that had repercussions and he was... uh, uh, banned for a couple of years because of because of that charge, and I don't think that had anything to do with Iditarod either. I think that was in the off season. What do you think about sort of the uh, 
the hubbub about it or it or it not being Iditarod's problem since it was not race season. Right. I think where um, a lot of that came in was a lot of non Iditarod followers were commenting on that original post saying, if he doesn't make it right, then you need to sue the Iditarod because he's an Iditarod musher. And so there was a lot of that confusion of, you know, Iditarod owns its mushers like the NFL or the NBA own their players. And while, yes, the Iditarod does hold all of its mushers that are active in a race to a standard, a very high standard, they, they have a lot of wiggle room in the case of the domestic violence. He wasn't really banned. It was one of those, if you do not follow the court mandate to a T, then you will be banned. The musher jumped through the hoops, and as far as we can tell, he's continued to follow, you know, whatever guidelines have been set in place. Um, where it's a little bit different with Jesse is we're talking about dogs. And that, you know, I think Rob said something about, you know, I did a rod where we're, you know, we're always saying that we're, you know, dog care is the most important thing. That is our main goal. So that I think is where I did a rod is really sitting and waiting and seeing what becomes of this case, you know, what the courts decide, you know, what the city of Wasilla decides before they take an action either way. Um, but it, you know, it, it's a great area. I mean, it does sound like it was just a very big lapse of judgment. I have seen distance mushers, um, loose drop dogs during, uh, you know, just even at vet checks at like the T200, there were a couple of um, teams that they maybe didn't do the whole team, but they did, you know, several dogs. And that just drove me nuts because they're just in the parking lot of a very busy sports complex down here on the peninsula and I'm like all I can think of is the dog's going to take off and it's going to be a nightmare so um, you know I do see it but like you said we don't see it a lot and it's not something that we think of now according to one of the stories I read Jesse said that mo you know most all of his dogs have great recall and so he didn't even think about it but he did have a couple of dogs, and I guess they were part of the pack that went after the little dogs that were new to him. And so I think it's just a huge boneheaded kind of lapse of judgment. And so it, it, it feels like an accident. It's not malicious. It's not something that, you know, he planned to do in like this super secret villain lair and then decided to, you know, enact it. Um, so I think... You know, it, I hope that whoever decides this case really looks at the whole picture. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes we in Alaska think that these guys have a lot of money because their names are in the paper for two weeks out of the year. But most of the mushers don't have a lot. He is a former reality TV star. But, uh, you know, I, I, I really hope that this is this is discussed fairly, not only in um, the media, but, of course, in the courts. So you sort of alluded to what your thoughts are with what will happen uh, with Iditarod. So what do you think moving forward about this sort of uh, under your thumb rule uh, during the off season? And I ask you that because of so much stuff that goes on uh, with animal rights activists and all of that. Do you think at some point in the near future that Iditarod will uh, uh, bring in the reins a little bit on Iditarod mushers and hold them a little bit more accountable for everything uh, like we talked about with NFL and stuff, or do you think they're going to be a little loose like they are now? You know, I think they were hoping that something like Mush Pride would do that so that they wouldn't have to be the governing body. Um, mushers in general, it's a culture, you know, that dates back way before either of us were even on the planet here. So, um, you know, there's, there's that independence, streak of you know nobody's going to tell me really what to do I'll follow the rules of the race but you don't get to tell me what to do the rest of the year I mean look at how much flack the Iditarod got when they first implemented the gag rule and how many times they've rewritten that because mushers don't like being told that they can't talk um, a certain way about certain things so it's um, I think Iditarod wants to be kind of thought of as like the big head of 
um, dog mushing or even dog sports now as they're going into, you know, showcasing other dog sports on their insider. Um, so it's possible. I, I don't know that I did a rod as the race would be the best way to have the governing body, but have something like they have over in Europe with the international sled dog association or whatever it's called. Um, I think that would be more of the way to go. So I don't know if that's mush with pride. I don't know if that's a new entity, but I don't think it should be Iditarod. That'd be like saying the Super Bowl is what um, governs the players of the football league and not the NFL. The NFL is separate from the Super Bowl, even though they're in charge of the Super Bowl. If that makes sense. Yep, I agree with you 100%. I think it will probably come down the pipe at some point in the near future. I do think it will probably be something very similar to the IFSS, as you mentioned, the International Federation of Sled Dog Sports, which is very prominent in Europe. Uh, we do have an organization like that here in the U.S. called the ISDRA, the International Sled Dog Racing Association. They do not have a rule like that, per se, that governs conduct, but there are already organizations in place. So it'll be interesting to see First off, how this story develops and uh, it, it all plays out, whether it's in the, the court of public opinion or in the regular courts, but we'll see soon enough. And of course, we'll talk about it on the episode when it does happen. So let's jump over to the Kobuk 440. You talked about that uh, when we talked about uh, Jesse Holmes heading that way. Uh, our last episode was just a couple of days before that race happened. And I tell you what, Tony... We talk about other sports being a race of inches when we think about horse racing and NASCAR and things like that. But you don't get much closer than uh, a couple of inches, uh, at least in terms of minutes, than the Kobuk 440, do you? No, it was it was crazy. You know, um, Richie Deal came in second behind Hugh Neff by only two minutes. Um, but Richie started with an hour deficit out of the last checkpoint, and he made up all of that time he nearly ran down Hugh. all they needed was a few more miles and they would have been reversed richie would have been the winner so it was really exciting um even the race when they were doing their live feed at the finish they weren't a hundred percent sure that it was you in front until he came across the uh they didn't really have a finish line they had two stakes in the sea ice and and so <laughs> or the ground wherever they were and and they just kind of passed by them but um yeah it was super exciting um really really fun race uh it was a little bit warmer than last year they didn't have to reroute this year um because of any cold or, or crazy weather so it was a really well-run race um some teams you know that they, they had a couple of scratches but for the most part it was a really exciting race from start to finish um, it was it was fun to watch all of the, the teams come in. Yeah, and a two minute uh, deficit uh, that that's a big deal, especially uh, when you have a four hundred and forty mile race. And I'm trying to think about how far that is, and I'm thinking it's like Jacksonville, Florida to Miami or something like that in terms of of a uh, lower forty eight uh, mileage comparison. So it's a heck of a long way to uh, to separate yourselves from the start and finish to end in just a couple of minutes. I know we've had real, really close finishes, and I did a rod one time. It was just a couple of seconds but otherwise they're usually spread out pretty pretty far in terms of of miles or hours or whatever and interestingly there was only one woman in the race uh, of the in the Kobuk mm -hmm. 440 uh do you have any story about her at all or um or or what you know she was running um dogs out of Milla Porcel's uh team uh, that ran the Iditarod. So it was just really exciting. I didn't really see a whole lot of coverage on Miriam. Um, but, you know, watching uh, Mila's Facebook account, her her uh, race page, they cheered Miriam on all the way through. Um, it was just really, you know, they made a big deal about her being the only woman at the Kobuk 440. But she she held her own in a very tough race. I think the average temperature was negative 30, and they were getting hit by wind the entire time. So it it's not a race for the faint of heart. 
for sure. <laughs> yeah, and, and this is this is pretty cool, guys, because in years past, we sort of let uh, the Iditarod be our, our crowning jewel of the season. Then we jump back into this with sporadic updates in the off season. I don't think we've ever talked in depth about the Kobuk 440, and that's one of the things that we're going to offer in this year-round coverage that Tony and I are doing. We're going to talk about these other races and add sort of commentary to that. And we're even going to showcase a race or two in the off season. I know that there's a race in Canada that's going to be a guest on later in the summer. And of course, as we lead up to some of these mid distance races, the connect 200, the copper basin, the willow 300, the Yukon quest, all of those races we'll talk a little bit about as well. So now let's jump over to our topic of the evening uh, we're trying to keep these shows under 30 minutes, so we keep our friends at the radio happy, but we may go over a little bit, and we are going to talk about what do sled dogs do in the summer, and I'm going to let Tony kick this off because she has a bit of a history with the CB Kennel. She's worked with those guys <laughs> in the past during their summer operation, so I would like you, Tony, to sort of give your perspective of what goes on down there in sort of the, the Kinnick. Uh, excuse me, the, the Kenai area. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the glaciers. And then, of course, what our dogs do in the um, in the summer up here in Willow. So what do you know about uh, down there in your area? Well, for the most part, there aren't too many uh, kennels that do tours. I do know that the Osmars and Monica Zappa, they'll do some uh, dry land uh, cart tours uh in their area in the Clam Gulch, Nanilchik area. Um, and then for the CVs, they have they are all over uh, South Central Alaska at this point. Um, summertime for a big racing kennel like Mitch CV's kennel, uh, that's when they are uh, going through and deciding which uh, dogs to breed together so that they can come up with the next generation of superstars, so there's a lot of puppies during the summer months. Um, and then when the puppies are born, they go to Seward to be handled by all of the tourists that come from the cruise ships as well as the train and on the road system. Um, they have a dry land cart tour that they uh, do around the CV's homestead property there in Seward that they've been there since the 60s. They also have glacier tours up in Girdwood. Um, and then you also have um, the glacier tour there in Seward that's not run by the Seabees, but it's run by uh, Travis Fields and Sarah Stokey. Um, and they also do tours for the cruise ships, anybody who comes to Seward, um, be it train, plane, automobile, boat, doesn't matter. They'll take anybody up on the glacier. Um, just a really exciting time. This is a great way for... Um, the dogs that maybe necessarily didn't go most of the race season um, and didn't go and I did ride, but this is where they shine. They may not be big fans of going a thousand miles in 10 days, but they're huge fans of meeting people and going multiple laps a day, um, either on the glacier or again, down on the, the gravel roads and the, the back <laughs> backwoods trails in Seward and uh, they, yeah, they, they seem to love it. And how I got involved with team CV originally was when Dallas had his show in Anchorage where we had this outdoor arena and we showcased the sled dog and all its forms from the big old Siberian and Malamute that you see in the movies to the Alaskan Huskies and how much smaller they are. Um, we did mock uh, races and training uh, demonstrations. It was a lot of fun, and you watch the dogs, and you know they're not just sitting on their keisters doing nothing. They're they're active, which is what you want to see. Other teams, they they don't do the tours, but they do take their dogs on long hiking trips. I know some. I think the Dieters are up past the Arctic Circle right now, chasing the snow until there's just no more snow to find. Um, so there's there's a lot of ways that they keep active in the summer, but it's definitely not the the training regimen schedule that we'll see come October, November. And Tony, you talked about uh, the cruise ships, and I know a big part of business, especially down in southeast Alaska, when you think about Skagway, mm -hmm. uh, Sitka, Juneau in particular, they have 
uh, glacier tours where a lot of the cruise ships stop and it becomes a, a, a shore excursion. And uh, they pay a pretty penny to do this, several hundred dollars to go up and ride uh, one of these sled dog rides. But what's what I find most interesting is it, it, it reminds me of the Old West. And I saw a picture just, I think it was yesterday, maybe this morning, of Nature's Kennel, which is based in Michigan. And they had this huge uh, dog truck and trailer set up. And I think they said that they were going to Juno or Skagway, one of those, with 72 mm-hmm. dogs uh, to, to go up on the glacier. So not only do those folks travel from Michigan, but a lot of of uh, mushers from South Central, Fairbanks, even, um, yep. you know, all areas of Alaska, uh, Canada as well, they convoy down to this part of Alaska to to service this uh, right. this this demographic. And it's not just to make money, as you mentioned. It's also to mm-hmm. see who the rising superstars are, to get training for puppies yep. and all of that. And it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big deal. And I would say a fair amount of mushers uh, earn their living this way. Is that right? Uh, quite a few. And we're really seeing that more and more as the quote unquote newer generation of dog musher comes up. A lot of them get their start from just um, answering a help wanted ad. Do you want to work on a glacier all summer? And they get trained to run dogs up there with these mushers that have been doing it forever. And, um, and so you're not just training the next generation of sled dogs, you're training the next generation of sled dog drivers. And it's, it's a really great opportunity. Um, you see it not just in, uh, you know, Southeast, but you see it in Seward. There's glaciers somewhere. I don't know. There, there's so many different glacier excursions now. It's really exciting to see. I think Dallas CV is even now doing tours on some glacier somewhere. So it's, um, it's a way to keep everyone's imagination, um, those that are visiting alive, because you heard it often in Seward and Anchorage where people are like, well, how do they run? There's no snow on the ground. And it's like, well, your dog runs on dirt. Our dogs run on dirt too. But it's very hard for people to understand that, you know, these, these dogs, they're not like polar bears. They don't need the snow and ice. They actually like the dirt too. Um, so it's, it's a great opportunity for mushers to learn from one another, to kind of scope out the competition, what they're doing, and maybe change up their style a little bit. Um, But it's also a way for them to positively give back to the community of mushing and to the races because you're you're a positive face for a, a lifestyle that gets maligned so often on social media by big corporations that really don't give one iota about these dogs. They're all in it for the bottom line because those CEOs are making a heck of a lot more in an hour than dog mushers will in a year. So um, it's, it's, it's a multifaceted um, benefit for, for dog mushing the mushers and the dogs themselves. It's it's a huge positive. And um, I'm really hopeful that with, the COVID restrictions lifting that we'll see an even bigger boon in tourism here in Alaska for those in the community that are, are working in the tourism industry. And just a couple more points about that tourist industry. I know at the Iditarod headquarters here in Wasilla, Ramey mm-hmm. and Barb Reddington are there just about every day uh, during the summer giving rides on a huge cart. It looks like an old pickup truck or something that they use to to pull <laughs> around. So they, they do that all the time. And I think that's relatively cheap in terms of, of fun things to do in Alaska. And mm-hmm. you had mentioned COVID restrictions. And I know, the, I know the last few years of the cruise industry in Alaska was really shut down. But in the past, uh, at least in the uh, few years leading up to Iditarod, they did an Iditarod cruise sort of thing where, where different mushers would come on at different points in the, uh, in the cruise itself and, and have, uh, you know, talks and Q and A's and that sort of thing. Do you know if that's happening this year or not? I haven't seen. 
You know, it's normally um, Libby Riddles is one of the ones that uh, gets to do that most often, and she does it all summer long. And I have not seen her say one way or the other if she's getting to do um, the talks on the cruise ships this year. Um, another one that used to do it was uh, Lance Mackey, but I'm not sure with his health and with his other interests and being a dad to two small children if he's even contemplating doing something like that this year um so i haven't seen anything about that yet and our dogs a little bit different perspective we do not do tours in the summer here our dogs literally uh uh, do the reverse hibernation thing. If you think about a bear, they get to take the time off. They get to relax. Uh, we'll do some fun runs with them if temperatures uh, 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 cooperate. But we like to think of our dogs like you think of Snoopy. All of our dog heart houses are painted bright red. And it's so often in the summer you will see 20 or 30 odd sled dogs sleeping right on the top of their house, splayed out for all the sunshine, and it looks exactly like the picture of Snoopy uh, in the comics. And and we do that for a few reasons. We want them to heal up. We want them to gain a little bit of fat with their with their muscle, and of course re- recoup from any injuries and just take some time off. And I think that's very important because we want, at least at our kennel, we want our dogs to be dogs, not just you know, so, uh, 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 a dog on a team that only has that purpose. We are fully invested in them being dogs themselves. And I'm sure there are many, many other kennels that have that same philosophy. But of course, I'm only speaking from personal experience. So there's lots of things that dogs do in the summertime, everything from tours to glaciers to sled dog visits to uh, presentations and everything in between. So it is definitely an ongoing process uh, for the entire dog's life. And as we've talked about it so many times on this show, mushing is a lifestyle. It's not like uh, football where you hang up the cleats in the wintertime or hockey where you only skate on the on the ice. This is something that happens 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it's definitely something that becomes and consumes your entire life for sure. Tony, before we close for tonight, do you have anything else you want to add? I just have one question. Which of your dogs then goes and flies and fights the Red Baron? <laughs> You know, we do not have one of those, but we've never had a dog named Snoopy. So if we ever have one named Snoopy, we'll definitely have to have a litter mate called Baron. And uh, and they can uh, battle each other, if you will, <laughs> during the free time. No more puppies. Sounds good. So anything else, Tony, before we go? I think we hit all of the topics that have been pressing so far. Uh, in the well since the last podcast all right so guys i encourage you to hit that subscribe button and that way you will never miss an episode it's tony and i's priority to do these every couple of weeks they will always air before thursday because we have to have it in for the radio show and just a quick teaser on the next episode since we've never done this before We are going to find out who Tony is. I know we've introduced her (laughs) on the shows, but uh, I'm going to come up with a bunch of questions and uh, we will learn all about Tony. And that way you can know who you are listening to behind the mic. So on behalf of my co-host and uh, all of our listeners, thank you until next time. Goodbye. From Dog Works Radio, this is Mushing Radio. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we invite you to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link on the episode notes. You can tap or swipe on the episode cover art, and you'll see some offers from our sponsors. You can support our show by supporting them. If you like what you have heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe, too. Your hosts are Alex Stein and Robert Forto. Our producer is Robert Forto, created for Dog Works Radio. We're living in uncertain times. If there is one thing we can be thankful for, that is the recent pet adoption boom. Shelters are being cleared out, and that means you may not know much about your new best friend. 
Alaska Dog Works virtual and on-site classes are the best way for you to build a lasting bond and learn about your pup, new or old. From setting up a proper routine to learning the commands and much more, Alaska Dog Works provides you with the resources to develop your dog into one of the best. Right now, Alaska Dog Works has an exclusive offer just for our listeners. Go to alaskadogworks.com now and use promo code DOGWORKS and save 20% off your training program at the time of your booking. Visit alaskadogworks.com and use promo code DOGWORKS to save 20% today. That's alaskadogworks.com and use promo code DOGWORKS at the time of booking.